Hello students, in the previous class uh, we had looked at uh, three dimensional continuum, we have seen the, uh, the stresses and the strains and then the definitions and in uh, today's class let us uh, look at uh, some special cases where we can approximate a three dimensional uh, stress state as an equivalent to two dimensional state so that we can gain some uh, uh, computational um, efficiency. So, let us look at um, uh, the brief outline. So, I will briefly summarize uh, the previous lecture so that we can have the continuity and then uh, the necessity for two dimensional approximations and different uh, 2D stress states, what are the examples and then the stress strain relations and then I um, will also consider one uh, special case uh, that is unique to uh, to geotechnical engineering that is the odometer um, stress state. So, we have seen the three dimensional continuum with uh, three axes x, y and z. Then we have defined uh, three planes perpendicular uh, to these axes. Perpendicular to x axis is our y z plane, perpendicular to z axis is our x y plane, perpendicular to uh, to y axis is our um, x z plane and so on. And then the stresses acting normal to these uh, planes are called as the normal uh, stresses and then the strains are the, uh, the stresses with um, parallel to these uh, planes they are called as the shear, uh, uh, shear strains or the uh, shear stresses and so on. Okay. And, um, in general our constitutive equation is also more complicated. It is a 6 by 6 matrix because we have 6 stresses and uh, 6 strains. And um, in the 3 dimensional uh, problems we have 15 unknowns and the 3D analysis is very cumbersome because first thing is even generating the mesh uh, for our analysis is uh, very complicated because uh, we have to imagine the third dimension and so it becomes very expensive for um, doing this analysis not only for mesh generation but also the computational effort. You will be dealing with very, very huge uh, uh, stiffness matrices and um, even after running the program processing the result uh, uh, results could take a long time. So, it is uh, most ideal if we can uh, come out with the two dimensional approximations um, so that we can reduce our computational effort and uh, do everything faster. And um, as a corollary, so all our geotechnical analysis are two dimensional like when we design a retaining wall or when we do a, a slip circle analysis for slopes, these are all uh, two dimensional and even the bearing capacity analysis, uh, it is basically a two dimensional like either a circular footing or a strip footing or a square footing and with the correction factors and so on. So, it makes sense even with the finite element analysis if we can uh, come out with uh, uh, simpler uh, um, situations where we can uh, do more efficient analysis. So, the two dimensional approximations there are three types, one is the plane stress, let me just get my laser pointer. Okay. So, we could have a plane stress or a plane strain or axis symmetric. So, let us see what they are. So, the plane stress state is actually the stresses in the outer plane direction are 0. It is actually you can imagine the plane stress, uh, the plane stress means basically all the stresses are acting in one plane and the outer plane stresses are 0. And uh, this could happen in the case of uh, very thin plates loaded in their own plane okay, uh, like our cantilever beams and we can have a plane strain case where all the significant strains are in one plane and the outer, mm, outer plane strains are 0 like for example, in the case of a very long retaining wall or a long embankment and so on. Then uh, axis symmetric, when we have radial symmetry in both the loading and also in the geometry. Like for example, you take 
cylindrical soil sample and subject it to all round pressure in our uh, triaxial compression test and there is a radial symmetry and we do not need to consider a three dimensional case for this and um, this is a classical case of axis symmetry and we will see what or uh, how we can um, simulate them. Okay. So, the plane stress state is a condition when all the significant stresses are acting in one plane uh, so that we can neglect the outer plane stresses. So, they need not be 0 like engine as engineers we make lot of approximations and if we can uh, neglect uh, the stresses that are acting in the outer plane direction we can consider that as a plane stress case and do the analysis um, in two dimensions rather than in 3 D. And if our um, x y is the plane of analysis our non-zero stress components are sigma x x, sigma y y these are the two normal stresses and then uh, one shear stress tau x y. So, we have only uh, 3 stress components instead of 6 and the outer plane uh, normal strain need not be 0 it depends on the Poisson's ratio. So, we are saying outer plane um, stress is 0, but the outer plane strain um, may be non-zero and the outer plane shear stress shear strains are 0 anyway because the outer plane shear stresses are 0. Uh, the shear stress and shear strain are directly related to each other uh, through the shear modulus. So, actually in all these um, approximations say in the plane stress see even if you do not calculate the outer plane strain nothing is going to happen because when we do the virtual work calculation as uh, the sigma times um, uh, strain um, since our outer plane uh, stress is 0 uh, the virtual work done uh, because of this out of, uh, out of plane um, stress and strain is 0. So, we do not really need to consider other than um, these 3 uh, stresses and uh, these 3 strains. Okay. So, some illustrations for the plane stress state. So, you can consider a thin plate and load it in its own plane and uh, that uh, can be analyzed as a as a plane stress case and uh, this is our thickness. It could be anything it could be a unit thickness or uh, some thickness and uh, we could have um, cantilever beam loaded in its own plane okay? either with a tip load or with a moment. In cross section it is like this and if you look at the perspective view it could be like this it has um, uh, some thickness in the outer plane direction. So, just imagine our uh, computer um, uh, screen as the plane of analysis our x y plane is our computer screen and anything going out of the computer screen is our z direction and our thickness is in the z direction okay. and our loading actually in the 2 D when we draw we only show one load, but it is actually it is a line load it is a line load continuously along the perpendicular uh, direction to the plane of analysis. And uh, in fact um, um, in all these uh, whether it is a plane stress or plane strain when we consider point load it is not really point load it is a line load ok and or uniform pressure we can think of either applying line loads or uniform pressure and um, but then what happens if you have a concentrated load a point load that becomes a fully three dimensional uh, we cannot um, um, have any plane stress idealization or a plane strain idealization. Examples uh, for the plane stress problems thin plate loaded in its own plane and another good example is the cantilever beam loaded in its own plane. And uh, uh, the plane stress state is more applicable for structural problems, but when it comes to soil mechanics problems the geotechnical engineering we have the self weight and because of that 
we have the stresses in all the directions whether it is x y or z we have the stresses so technically speaking we will not be able to come across or we will not be able to solve any geotechnical problem reasonably with a plane stress approximation we need to go in for something else because of the presence of all round in situ pressures and the constitutive matrices for um, constitutive matrix for the plane stress state uh, is very simple so we have only uh, three significant uh, st uh, strains epsilon xx epsilon yy and gamma xy and we can invert uh, this and uh, write the strain uh, the stress in terms of uh, strains like this sigma xx sigma yy tau x y is uh, e by 1 minus mu square multiplied by this sum uh, uh, matrix 1 mu 0 and so on and then epsilon x x epsilon y y gamma x y these are the three uh, strains in, a, in, the, in the plane strain case and after um, you perform the analysis we can calculate uh, the strain in the outer plane direction epsilon z z as minus mu by e times sigma x plus sigma y right and the Poisson's ratio here can be anything it um, um, it can be any value within the reasonable limit like minus 1 to mm, 1 to 0.5 okay. then uh, similar to plane stress case we have a plane strain um, case where all the significant uh, strains are acting within one plane say if our um, x y is the plane of analysis we will have epsilon x x epsilon y y and then um, within the same plane our gamma x y okay. and all the outer plane strains are 0 so in the epsilon z is 0 gamma y z gamma x z are 0 and uh, but then uh, the outer plane uh, strain is 0 but outer plane stress need not be 0 it depends on the Poisson's ratio okay. um, some examples uh, for the plane strain state if you have a long retaining wall or a, sorry long uh, wall footing or a strip footing with a uniform loading along the length that we can consider as a plane strain state by considering unit length or we could have a long retaining wall or uh, of uniform height and loading so if you have uh, let us say along uh, the length uh, your height of the wall is increasing gradually that cannot be simulated as a as a plane strain case um, we should uh, go in for full three dimensional but then as engineers uh, we can approximate it uh, with an average height of the wall and then take some uh, in some unit um, uh, length uh, along the length uh, uh, unit uh, width along the length and then uh, do the analysis we could have a long tunnel or um, uh, stress state within a direct shear box is also a plane strain state because um, say along the shear direction we will have the stresses and then perpendicular to that your strain is 0 because of the rigid um, shear box or it could also be uh, the same thing with the simple shear apparatus rectangular uh, with uh, a rectangular um, um, shape ok. See um, most hand calculations in our geotechnical designs are um, done in the plane state a uh, plane strain condition like either um, the design of retaining walls or embankments or uh, with the design of sheet pile walls everything is done for a unit length in the outer plane direction assuming a plane strain um, um, uh, situation ok. So the plane strain state is if our x y is the plane of analysis at the 0 strains are epsilon z z gamma x z gamma y z are 0 and the normal stress in the z direction is sigma z is mu times sigma x plus sigma y right and uh, we can invert our um, constitutive matrices and write the stress in terms of strain like this sigma 
x x sigma y y tau x y is um, e by 1 plus mu times 1 minus 2 mu multiplied by this uh, matrix and the strain vector. This is the uh, relation between the stress and strain in the case of uh, plane strain and if you look at this equation we have 1 minus 2 mu in the denominator and what happens if you substitute a Poisson's ratio of 0.5. The whole thing will blow up because we have 0 in the denominator and the 1 by 0 is um, it is infinite and our computer program will just simply crash. So, if you are um, Poisson's ratio is a 0.5, what we do is um, um, we can uh, apply 0.49 or 0.499 or something like that and um, and then get around uh, this problem of uh, the uh, the zero being in the in the denominator see this problem we did not have with the plain stress uh, case because in the denominator we have 1 minus mu square and even if uh, mu is 0.5 it's not a problem we can um, um, we'll have a um, finite value So, now that uh, we have seen both uh, plane stress and plane strain, um, a question um, can arise. So, you have a problem and um, you can idealize that uh, as a plane stress case or idealize that as a plane strain uh, case separately and uh, is it possible that both the solutions are the same whether uh, you approximate it as a plane stress case or a plane strain case. Can we get the same result? If we can get the same result what are the requirements? What are the boundary conditions under which we can get the same, um, same result? You think about and uh, you can send me the answers. Now, there is one more um, uh, simplification uh, that is the axis symmetric case, there is radial symmetry <coughs> in both the, uh, the geometry and also in the loading. So, that uh, uh, we can consider um, um, a section of this and then, um, then do the analysis um, in the two dimensional, uh, um, uh, uh, two dimensional framework. So, in the case of axis symmetric analysis, <coughs> we will have one more strain called as the, as the circumferential strain or the hoop strain. So, just imagine a cylinder and as you go on compressing, its diameter will go on increasing. So, that means that the circumference is going to increase. So, based on this, we can uh, define one uh, circumferential strain epsilon theta as the change in the circumference divided by the original circumference. So, if r is the, the radius and u is the radial deformation, uh, the change in the circumference is 2 pi times r plus u minus 2 pi r and um, the original circumference is a 2 pi r okay? and uh, that epsilon theta becomes u by r, u is the radial displacement at the, at the radius of r. Okay. So, epsilon theta is the additional quantity that we need to consider in the axis symmetric case. So, one good example um, for the axis symmetric case is our um, a triaxial compression test performed on cylindrical uh, soil samples. and uh, or uh, circular footing subjected to uniform pressure or a circular pile with the uniform pressure and then the typical consolidation test on soils. So, the consolidation test is uh, done on a, on a cylindrical sample, it is a round sample 60 millimeter diameter and the height is 20 millimeters and then we apply uniform pressure on the entire surface of the soil and that is also a typical uh, axis symmetric case okay. and uh, we can derive the stress strain relations like this. 
In fact, uh, this um, uh, this stress strain relation is very close to the tough um, the plane strain case, except that uh, we have the fourth row corresponding to circumferential stress and uh, circumferential strain. Um, and actually, um, this has uh, four rows and four columns because we have um, uh, four stress and uh, four strain components sigma r, sigma z, tau r z, and then um, sigma theta. Um, so, actually, this should be x y. And um, in this equation, by setting epsilon theta to 0, uh, we can make this constitute matrix applicable even for the plane strain case. Because in the plane strain case, you have sigma theta that is sigma z z, but your outer plane strain is 0. So, we can set this to 0 and use exactly the same uh, uh, constitute matrix even for the plane strain case. So, just to give you one example, um, see we have a 2 meter wide uh, strip footing and then a 2 meter uh, diameter circular footing and both are loaded with the same pressure of 100 kPa. And the strip footing is a typical plane strain case whereas, circular footing with a uniform pressure we can consider as a as an axis symmetric one. Okay. So, our axis um, of uh, symmetry axis is along the central axis. So, just imagine you rotate it, then you will get back your cylindrical uh, shape. Okay. And um, if you plot your uh, uh, stress contours, uh, this contouring um, was done in a separate uh, program, not in the GeoFEM. What we do is uh, we get the result in the GeoFEM and give this data to some other uh, uh, contouring package that can draw the contours. And uh, these are the stress contours below a strip footing. So, mm, at um, uh, applied pressure is 100, then minus, uh, minus 35, minus 25, minus 15 and so on. And um, these are the stress contours below, below the, uh, the circular footing. And what you can notice is that within a short depth, uh, most of the stress is dissipated because in the case of um, uh, circular footing or square footings, you have low dispersion in all the directions. Whereas, in the case of um, strip footing, you have low uh, dispersion only in one direction. So, the low dispersion is very, very slow in the case of um, uh, strip footing. So, that means that even if you go very deep, there will still be some significant uh, pressure. So, for example, um, uh, let us take um, uh, say 15 kPa um, uh, pressure because I can see that here and also there and the 10, uh, 10 kPa contour line is uh, maybe this is the 10 kPa contour line which may be occurring at a large depth. Um, say 15 uh, kilo Pascal um, contour is acting at a depth of uh, almost uh, 9 meters below the footing. Okay. Whereas, in the um, in below the strip footing, whereas um, in the case of um, circular footing, uh, this is the, uh, the 15 kPa uh, contour and it is acting at a depth of 3 meters. So, at a height of 15 um, meters, 100 kPa pressure was applied and within 3 meters uh, distance, significant amount of uh, the applied pressure is dissipated. Okay, so, uh, uh, you see that uh, the stress is uh, dissipated faster in the case of um, uh, circular footing. So, actually remember uh, one question that we normally ask uh, in the ground improvement whether the depth of borehole uh, can be the same for design of a strip footing or for, um, for a circular footing, assuming that uh, both are um, having similar dimensions like the same 
uh, width of the footing of the diameter and uh, the answer expected answer is the bore hole should be deeper below the uh, below the strip footing and the reason for that answer is this so the pressure is uh, dispersed over a much larger depth below the strip footing compared to the uh, compared to the square or uh, circular footing okay so let's look at uh, constraint modulus uh, in the odometer test odometer test is um, is the consolidation test that we perform in a consolidation ring that is um, cylindrical in shape it is a 60 millimeter diameter the height is only 20 millimeters and we determine the, um, the consolidation properties and the radial strains are zero because of the rigid ring that we have around the soil sample and the ratio between the vertical stress and the vertical strain is uh, given as the in the constraint modulus and this constraint modulus could be higher than the Young's modulus that we have okay. and um, so we can um, actually um, apply lateral strains as 0 because our sigma x and sigma y they are in the lateral directions so we can set them to 0 and by setting epsilon xx to 0 we get sigma xx is mu times sigma y plus sigma z and epsilon y is uh, 0. So, from here we get sigma y is uh, mu times sigma x plus sigma z and by solving uh, these two simultaneous equations we get uh, sigma x and sigma y as uh, mu by 1 minus mu times sigma z. Okay, the lateral stress is uh, mu by 1 minus mu times sigma z and um, so by substituting um, these two equations in the equation for epsilon z epsilon z is minus mu times sigma x by e minus mu sigma y by e plus sigma z by e and sigma x and sigma y they are determined as mu by 1 minus mu times sigma z okay so that becomes uh, mu square by 1 minus mu and so on and we can simplify this whole thing on the right hand side as 1 plus mu times 1 minus 2 mu by 1 minus mu times sigma z by e. Now our constraint modulus can be written as sigma z by epsilon z as e times 1 minus mu by 1 plus mu times 1 minus 2 mu. Okay. So, depending on the Poisson's ratio that you have uh, the constraint modulus could be very high. Let us look at um, um, some other cases that require full three dimensional analysis. So, if you have a square footing you cannot um, simulate any symmetry like you cannot you do not have a radial symmetry unlike in a circular footing the square footing um, has to be analyzed as a three dimensional um, problem or um, let us say you have a circular footing but with some eccentric loading. Then the, uh, the geometry is um, axisymmetric because it is circular but then because of the eccentricity of loading you are um, um, you will not have any radial symmetry in the in the response. So, we should ideally analyze that as a three dimensional um, problem okay. and um, we may have some combined footings. Uh, they also require full 3D analysis at uh, the piles under lateral loading. Let us say you have a circular pile, but apply some lateral loading. Uh, the soil stresses are not symmetric with respect to any radial um, radial line that you have. Okay. So, we need to go in for full three dimensional analysis for those cases at uh, the group of piles or if you have any retaining wall or embankment. Uh, their height is changing or the soil properties are changing then we cannot ideally simulate them as as a as a plane strain case or axis symmetric case so we have to go in for full 3d or sometimes we may have this type of problems so along the length we have a sheet pile wall and then we placed some strut elements along the length and the height 
or we may have some anchor elements. So, if this is the situation, can we do some simplification or should we analyze this uh, only as a three dimensional problem? So, the uh, this can be idealized as a as a plane strain case by using some engineering approximations. So, we take a unit length in the perpendicular direction and uh, prorate the contribution of our anchors at the struts over uh, that the unit length 1 meter length and then do the analysis using a plane strain approximation. Okay. And uh, let us look at a small numerical example to illustrate our uh, calculations. Let us say that our soil sample has a Young's modulus of 35,000 and the Poisson's ratio of 0.4 and the strains at a point in a long uh, embankment are like this epsilon x x, epsilon y y and gamma x y and uh, we are asked to estimate uh, the stress state corresponding uh, to these strains and then the volumetric strain. See we are referring to a long embankment and uh, nothing else is given. So, we can assume that uh, the embankment is of um, uniform height and then the soil properties are uniform. So, we can consider this um, stress state as a plane strain condition and uh, as the normal strain in the outer plane direction is 0 epsilon z is 0. So, our volumetric uh, strain epsilon v is just simply epsilon x x plus epsilon y y and the sum total of all the normal strains is called as the volumetric strain. So, epsilon x plus epsilon y that comes to minus 0.032 okay. and uh, our constitute equation uh, for the plane strain case can be written um, with the same equation that we had with, uh, uh, with the axisymmetric uh, problem except in place of epsilon z we put a 0. And the advantage that we get here is uh, directly by by doing this calculation we get the sig sigma z also, but that is only like an ornament it is not going to add any value. It is uh, because uh, the virtual work done uh, in terms of um, sigma z and epsilon z is 0. So, this information is only additional information, but in terms of um, uh, the computation it has no significance. Okay. So, if you compute your sigma x x, sigma y y, tau x y and sigma z z, uh, they are uh, computed using uh, uh, this constitutive um, relation between the stress and the strain. Okay. So, in this class we have seen the two dimensional approximations of the full 3 D problem and in general we prefer uh, using a two dimensional analysis because uh, it is much faster to first thing is uh, to for solving the equations and even the mesh generation is very simple and uh, we can imagine the shape and everything because it is two dimensional we can draw a sketch on the on a piece of paper and then see how it looks. Okay. And, um, and there are some cases that you cannot uh, simplify either as a plane stress or a plane strain or axis symmetric we have to go in for uh, full 3 D. Okay. Um, that I have mentioned, I have given some examples. Okay. So, if you have any questions, please uh, write to me at uh, profkrg at uh, gmail.com, then I will reply back to your um, questions. Okay. So, thank you very much, we will meet next time.